Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Let me know when you're live. I mean, glory. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're here. Amen. <laughs> We're here. We're seated in heavenly places. We're joined heirs with Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> We're not with <well> hands. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I'm trying to think how to uh, really do this, and um, I was thinking of when uh, about testing and tests, and I just thought of the way Daniel brings it really practical when he does what he does in the morning, but you know, when I was in ORU back in 84, 85, 83, 84, 85, and all in the early 80s, when I was a sophomore, I was really struggling. I mean, I would study all night long to pass a test, whether it was calculus or organic, or I was getting into differential equations, then peak him, and, and I, was I, was, I was studied all night. And then I heard the Lord say to me, give me more time. Give me more time. So I decided, okay, I'm going to start. Every day I knew I, had a, I would go to lunch about this time, and because I started early, and then from about 12-something, I knew I'd go up to my room. I had an hour gap. So I decided, okay, I'm just going to take that hour, and I'm just going to read my Bible and pray at that certain time in the middle of the day every day. And the minute I started, you know, seeking first, I don't know I'm saying, we're still seeking the kingdom of God, but really making it a habit of spending time with the Lord and giving Him time, giving Him more time. The next thing you know, when I went to my tests, man, I was passing my tests. By the time I got my junior and senior year, I was getting like straight A's, and I was making major progress. And I noticed that when we position ourselves in the Spirit, and we go higher in the Spirit, and we sit ourselves on the Lord, amen, then He's going to give us insight into breaking these certain barriers, and being able to see things from a higher perspective. A lot of times we're trying to take care of things ourselves. You know, whether we realize it or not, um, I was looking up certain things on just being tested, testing your identity. And I think one of the biggest things with David, like we're talking about kings and raising kings, is when a person's identity is being tested. Is your identity. Who are you? And uh, remember when the devil came to Jesus. First, he tempted him several ways. And one of the temptations when he came to Jesus was, if you be the Son of God, who's with me, cast yourself down and the angels will pick you up lest you dash your foot upon a rock. And what the devil was doing was he's quoting the Psalms. He was quoting a scripture from the Bible to Jesus. Amen. But at the same time, he was trying to use scripture. And Jesus said, uh, remember, he was trying to tempt Jesus, if, if, do you know who you are, if you are the Son of God? Well, Jesus knew he was the what? Son of man. And the revelation there is very powerful because Jesus knew who he was. Because after that temptation, remember when the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus, the Holy Spirit says to him, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But remember Jesus said to him, you know, every time the devil would come and give Jesus a tempt, if you are the Son of God, do this. So if you are the, you know what I mean? The angel will pick you up, and, and Jesus said, remember, he always directed everything to the Father. Amen? All the worship belonged to God. Everything was directed back to God. And he didn't yield to the temptation. But notice what the enemy was working on was identity. He was working on identity. He never stops, like we said in the Garden of Eden. We shared this in early on in one of the series. He never stops. Uh, you know, in the day that you eat of this tree... You will be like God. Hallelujah. So the enemy is always, to me, it seems like he's on a continual pursuit uh, on attacking people's identity. You're not good enough. You're not worthy enough. You're not a son of God. You don't know who you are. You don't know where you're going. You're not, you don't know what you're called to do. And, and whether we realize our, uh, our ability to add value to other people, our ability to impact other people, it's all rooted in, it, it's not, you cannot separate it from identity, uh, when you know who you are, amen, 
Peter knew that he got the revelation upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When, when he got that, by the time, even though he denied Jesus three times, but by the time Pentecost came, Peter was the one preaching and thousands were coming. Peter was the one who ended up casting shadows. I tell you what happened, he sorted out who he was. He sorted out who he was. He found out who he was, and that began to... So we talked about identity, remember, in the sense of David. And um, the other thing is, is identity with David was established, I wrote down here, was established through many difficult situations. Another thing that I mentioned as we were closing the last time was words. Uh, pure words. Uh, is a key to the convergence of your destiny. Uh, what you say, what you speak. Amen. Psalms chapter 12, verse 6. Let me start here. Psalms 12, verse 6. Amen. Psalms chapter 12 and verse 6. And I love David. Uh, one thing about David is worship was such a big part of his life. I mean, how many psalms do we have here? Holy macro. Psalms, 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 psalms. My God, Psalms, Proverbs, you know, like Psalms doesn't, you know. Yeah, we got 150 Psalms. I mean, trust me, they didn't just start when he was king. He was out there playing his harp, worshiping God when he was just a shepherd boy, and he was nobody. Born, amen. He said, my mother conceived me, remember, in iniquity. Who remembers when I talked about that? Amen. And I told you what the rabbis have said about that, and basically what they concluded was that David was the one that the mother, that, that David's father had out of, who's with me, with one of the maids. Hallelujah. And so David wasn't like all his other brothers, a pure son of the house. Amen. He, was, he came about because the father cheated. Hallelujah. <laughs> Some of you are thinking about it. Well, we talked about that. Imagine that. Oh, yeah, yeah, here's all my boys, Jesse. You know, here comes, you know, here comes Samuel. You know what I mean? Here's this boy, this son, this son, this son. Hey, don't, uh, none of those are going to be king. Do you have any other kid? Oh, yeah, the one out in the field who's with me. Didn't even call him in. He wasn't even there when Samuel was there. No, no, that was the one year there that was born, kind of threw a mess up. Hallelujah. Uh, okay, okay, go get him, hallelujah. So, you know, David had, like we've shared before, David had all the odds against him. Not only had his brother Eliab getting mad at him when he comes to the battlefield. Who do you are, you insolent one? Who did you leave the sheep with? And who do you think you are coming to the battle? And David's just coming to bring his brothers food and bread. And he's just coming to serve them and love them. But think about all the tests that David had to go through. And here he's writing in Psalms, the words of the Lord are pure words. Silver tried like fire. And I thought to myself, boy, David, David wrote this. Something about him. And I was looking yesterday, thinking about all the tests that David did. And I'm going to go into some of this. But one of the things that I found was amazing when you get into Samuel is there's this part with Jonathan and David and how, you remember, uh, you know, how that David got cheated and We've talked about that. His very words, who's with me, his very words didn't help his situation. When he said, ah, David said to Saul, who am I and what is my life and my father's family, Israel, that I should be the king's son-in-law. Remember we told you about this in Psalms in 1 Samuel 18, 18. And we noticed that when he put that word, who's with me, what happened? He lost that wife. Amen. She was given over to another. And it was only later on after he became king over, the, not just king over Judah, but king over Israel, did we start up with the verse, like, I think about two months ago, where it says, and David perceived, who's with me? David perceived that he was king of Israel. Perceived that the Lord had made him king. Can you believe it took all that? After he was finally, not just king of Judah, king of Israel, finally got this revelation, I perceived that the Lord has made me king. Finally, he recognized, who's with me? Something finally came into his spirit. This is who I really am. Now, it went through a lot, but one thing we see about David's life when it comes to testing and that is, and I love this verse in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 18 and verse 30, amen, 1 Samuel eighteen thirty. it says, Then the commanders of the Philistines 
1 Samuel 18.30. And the commanders of the Philistines went out to battle, and it happened as often as they went out that David, I love that, behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul. So his name was highly esteemed. David behaved himself more wisely. And so you can see this development of character, the development of David's life as he begins to go through a change. And I realized something is that I wrote down a couple of statements, the greater the anointing, the greater the testing. Sometimes we think because the anointing gets bigger, the tests are going to get smaller. No, that's nonsense. The greater the anointing, the bigger the testing. You'd be amazed how many big ministers have fought into, fall into adultery and to all kinds of things because... You know, they're preaching and they get famous and then all kinds of women run around them. And uh, before you know it, everyone wants to be that famous preacher's wife and everything. And even though he's got a wife, I mean, other people come along and think God told them to be the wife of the guy who's already married. Hallelujah. You know what I mean? Some prophetess. God spoke to me and said, I'm going to be your wife. But his guy's already married. Hallelujah. You know what I'm saying? Don't believe me. This stuff happens all over the place. Hallelujah. And some ministers have fallen for this hogwash with fame and seduction and all these things, amen? So don't think that the testings and the trials don't get less, amen? People have a way but to, to manipulate things. But in his perception as king, when he finally perceived that he was king, he shifted an entire nation. I realized something. When you begin to perceive who you are, it's only then you get empowered. That's when power comes in to change, to create a change around you. Your identity has great impact uh, to change. Uh, a worshiping, David was a worshiping king. And I wrote down, yeah, it takes a worshiping king, who's with me, to bring the Ark of the Covenant back. It took a worshiping king to say, hey, wait a second, where is the Ark of the Covenant? Let's bring, remember the Ark had been stolen and it came to Kijat Jorin. And then finally David was trying to get this Ark back. And David was doing everything he can. At first he failed the test because he got a guy called Uzo and Uyo to try put this, you know, one guy's name means just self-strength and the other guy's name means brotherly love. So, uh, and then they put on an ox cart and it's not supposed to be carried on an ox cart. This is the human's way of doing things. This is the church, the tradition, religion. This is the world's way of trying to carry in the glory of God. We've got a mechanism. Let me explain. We do three songs, 30-minute sermon. We do this. We've got a beautiful ox cart. An ox cart is a beautiful denominational, systematic, theological, religious system and so they're excited. let me tell you let me tell you how we're going to get the glory of god it is the way we're going to get the glory of god where it is and david went through this process is through brotherly love we're all just going to have brotherly love good social stuff in the church everything the other one is we're going to have self-strength we're going to make sure everyone's positive be positive walk positive talk positive all the positive we can get so we're going to get all the positive people and all the brotherly love people together and they're going to put this on this beautiful church mechanism we're going to have we're going to have, uh, how can I say, we're going to have the smoke machines, the laser lights. I mean, we're just going to have it all. We've got this beautiful mechanism, who's with me, to attract everybody to the church, who's with me. And David was trying to bring the glory of God in it that way at first. And it didn't work very well, hallelujah. One guy tried to reach and touch it, who's with me, and he was struck dead. And David realized, oh, my God, this is not going to work. So he finally had to go to God and say, okay, Lord, how are we going to do this, Lord? How's it going to happen? And God said, hey, wait a second. So it sat at this guy's house. And while the ark of God sat at the guy's house, that guy just got wealthy. I mean, that guy just became the richest guy in the land because he's got the ark of the covenant parked in his house. No one's touching it, but it's there. Hallelujah. And David finally gets the system, hallelujah, and says, I'm going to get the ark of God back. And so he has, to get six, he has to get six Levites and true priests. And this is where he gets the order of Zadok, amen. And then he gets the different Levites, whose name means God is strength. God will uphold. God is illumination. God is revelation. Um, God will, in, in, you understand, and every one of the names of the eight guys who are now going to carry, the people who are going to carry this Ark of the Covenant, all have a God name. It's like having eight people with the name God in your name to carry the glory of God now, where it needs to go on the shoulders of the priests under God's divine order. So basically it was like plurality came along, wasn't carried on the shoulder of one person, Plurality came along who all had the name of God. God will illuminate. God is strength. God will uphold. God is mighty. God will reveal. This was the names of all the people, and they're going to carry this thing back when he should. So David learned a big test. Sometimes he didn't pass the test right away, 
but he had tests in his life. I'm just trying to explain to you. Hallelujah. Because sometimes we try to do things. Let me tell you how to get close to God. I'm going to tell you how it's going to work for me. I've got the strategy. I'm going to pray so many hours. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. If I do this, this, and this, you know, I've got a formula down. Who's with me? And now, and some people like to negotiate with God. I tell you what, God, if I do this for you, you better do this for me. And boy, if you don't come through, God, well, that's it. I'm over. I'm leaving you. Who's with me? Like trying to tell God how to do things. Who's with me? Now, I'm going to tell you, Lord, I'm going to pray this, and I'm going to, and I'm going to do this. Lord, I'll tell you what, the next week, I'm going to watch TV for a whole week, so you better do this, Lord. If you don't, but you know what I mean? Like, like if I'm going to negotiate with God, and now, who's with me? I don't know. You know, today, that's probably how they negotiate. Somebody's probably negotiated that before. Um, and so I wrote down, anointing without identity cannot shift anything. An anointing without identity cannot shift anything. Anointing without identity. Sometimes people have the Spirit of the Lord is upon them, but if you don't know who you are, you have a treasure in earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of man. And David realized that uh, David had a, tr- you know, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 7 tells us that we have a treasure in earthen vessel that the excellency of the power may be of man and not of man. And, you know, David had to treasure Samuel's word. And I realized for David, Samuel came along, and many times David wanted to do something, but boy, David, after a while, had to learn to treasure the words he received from Samuel. It's almost like here's the man of God, the priest of God, trying to speak to a king, a king who's with me in growth, a king coming into his place who's with me, a king flourishing. Now, one thing I like about David is I believe one of the things that gave him an edge to pass the tests was that he was a worshiper. He was a worshiping king. I do believe being a worshiper gives him an edge. It gave him an edge. What I mean, it gave him an advantage. It doesn't matter what you're taking on. When you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. And when you put God first or seek God or set your mind on things above, there's something about loving the Lord that brings a clarity to your consciousness. It brings a wisdom in place that you couldn't get any other way, and you see things clearly. You see things from the place of where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And I think a lot of times what happens is people are looking at things, but they can't see. And they're like wondering, why can't I not see? Why don't I know? Why am I just stuck? You look how these people are fighting. They're even trying to use the name of God to say almost like, I cannot believe even the president of America is trying to put God would like to abort people or God is for abortion. Uh, when you get to a place of a demaced mind and you try to connect God to killing babies, who's with me? Uh, you know that someone has gone to the place of a debased mind, void of judgment. Something's not really clear. It means you're not really a lover of Jesus. You're not really a worshiper. You're listening, but something's really strange. I think Joseph, you know, thank God Joseph received encouragement, received certain things from his father and things like that. And Joseph, I wrote down, yeah, carry the dream until the dream carries you. I think a lot of times when we receive something from God, you have to hold on to it. Joseph held on to his dream, who's with me, and his dream somehow gave him a strong will to pass the test against Potiphar's wife. I love this video I watched the other day. It talks about either, either running or flirting, and it's talking about how that, you know, Joseph didn't try to be an evangelist uh, to Potiphar's wife and try to flirt with her and try to bring her religion or stuff like that, who's with me. No, when she came off to me, he just ran. And he was making the, the difference between, and this was before there ever was any New Testament or anything. I just loved the way the video was dealing with certain things and how Joseph had to pass the test. He ran. All this guy had was willpower. He had a dream from God and he wasn't going to let that dream, who's with me, he wasn't going to let that, he, he's going to keep carrying that dream. He wasn't going to let that go. And somehow it strengthened him to say no, who's with me, to sexual sin, no to lust. No to certain things, to pass a test so he can move forward and end up becoming second in command. I think part of his wife was probably his main thing. If he fell to that lady and she seduced him, man, the story of Joseph would be a disaster. Hallelujah. But thank God he held on to what he had received from God, knowing one day he'll rule and reign. Thank God he held on to what the, something from the Lord and I think that's so powerful. And so you need to have the Holy Spirit, but you need to have a holy identity. And you need to understand in a holy identity, there's a holy assignment. 
Remember 1 Corinthians 2, 9, all the way through 15, it says the Spirit of God reveals the deep thoughts of God. The Spirit of God knows God. God knows God. God knows exactly where you're at. God knows exactly what you're going through. He knows your struggle. You know, I talk about the difference between compassion and empathy, but the only time the word actually sympathy is mentioned is that Jesus sympathized in our weaknesses in that he was tempted as we are tempted. Can you believe Jesus understand what it's like to be tempted? And in that area, he can sympathize. He understands. And he's there. The Holy Spirit said he'll not allow you to be tempted above a measure that you cannot. He'll always find a way, who's with me, to make an escape, to help you escape. When we trust the Holy Spirit, I was even looking up something yesterday on trust, how to restore trust, how to gain trust, how to get someone's trust back. Hallelujah. Those are very powerful things, amen, uh, because trust is also a powerful thing when it comes to, who's with me, stepping out in what God's calling. And I can see, I can see David had to go through a lot of stuff trying to get to the place where he was king. Look at Psalms 105, verse 17. And there, uh, the reason I'm bringing up Psalms is because I'm still seeing this from David as a king. Amen. David as a king and a priest in Psalms and singing this psalm. I do not know how he'd be singing Psalms 105, but you see, he knows all these stories and he also knows a lot of these things. Let me have Psalms. What's it? 105, verse 17 and 19. Look at this. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. Now, I remember he's playing this on a harp. How would he know? He's got all this information who's with me. And look at this in verse 18. They afflicted his feet with fetters. He himself was laid in irons. Look at David singing this. Verse 19. Until the time that his word came to pass. Huh? The word of the Lord tested him. David's singing here. A harp, come on, he's the worshiping king. He's going through tests himself. He knows something about tests. Until the word, until the, until the word of the Lord tested him. Now remember Joseph, think about Joseph. Joseph is before there was a Torah. By the time David gets around, at least he's got the first five books of the Bible. He's got Genesis, Exodus, Numbers. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, who's with me? He's got the Torah. I mean, David has the ability, who's with me? The scrolls, he has the availability to study the Torah. When they were little, they had to literally memorize some of those books. See, with the way I understand it from rabbinical teachings, that during the time when David was king, by the time you were 12, 13 years old, you had to have the first five books of the Bible memorized. That was the same during the time of Elijah. If you look up the Mishnah writings, you look up the other writings during the time of Elijah, when Elijah was around as a prophet, for him to even be considered a prophet in that time, when you look up any other writings and Jewish writings or rabbinical teachings at that time, other historical writings, writings, Elijah, when he was a kid going to school, the prophet Elijah called fire down from heaven. They say by the time he was 13 years old, when he'd go through the certain transition or whatever as a Jewish kid, he had to have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy memorized. That's not just for me. That comes from other writings during the same time as Elijah, the same time as David, who's with me. Hallelujah. Now imagine, yes, Elijah's got the first five books of the Bible memorized. But now David is singing of Joseph. When was Joseph? Joseph's in the book of Genesis. It hasn't even been written. And Joseph's like the word of the Lord testing him. What was the word of the Lord? Well, Joseph had a dream. A dream came to him. He saw himself rise as a harvest over the other harvests who room and then bound it. He saw himself rise in the story of the moon, the suns, and the stars. Come on, who's with he had this dream. All the only word that Joseph had from the Lord was that dream. That word seed in a form of a dream. And until the time that his word, that dream, who's with me? That word dream came to pass. The word, that dream is what? Can you hold on to who, what God says you are? Can you hold on to who God says you're going to be? Where you're going to go? What you're going to become? Oh, I see myself rising as the head of a harvest. Here comes Potiphar's wife. Oh, do this. Oh, no. Here's a distraction. Here's a temptation. Here's something who's with me to keep me from what I see God has called me to be. And boy, unless you've got that thing solid inside you 
you will not pass the test. Mary said, be it unto me according to thy word. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. And so when you hold on to that, hold on to the word of God. And yet David is singing this, the word of the Lord. I want you to get this phrase, the word of the Lord. Tested Joseph and the Bible has not been written. So what is David talking about? He's talking about this dream seed from God. Something from God was sown into Joseph. That was establishing his identity, who he was, what he's going to become. His name's going to get changed from Joseph to Zephaniah. God speaks and he lives. At first, the dream was silent. But as the dream grew in power, the dream gained an ability. Who's with me? To get stronger and stronger. The dream gained the ability to interpret other people's dream. And as he held on to the, before you know it, the dream took on a voice. And when the dream, when that word inside Joseph took on voice, it was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream. And before you know it, Pharaoh changed his name and says, God speaks and he lives. And we've studied this before. I've shared with you when you go to the tomb of Joseph and it's empty, you can see the hieroglyphics. I remember Billy Brim sharing about it many years back, about how if you went into the place where Joseph was, you can see how people had to bow down before Joseph by the thousands every time he came out and literally say his name three times over to him. God speaks and he lives. God speaks and he lives. God speaks and he lives. Imagine every time you get it in front of people, they call you God speaks and he lives. God speaks and he lives. Now, you understand where... where you understand, now you now David perceived he became king. You understand, now you know who you are. Now you know how to test your brothers. Remember he did that? He became Joseph. They came, what did he do? He put the cup in, the, in one of their bags. He, was, he went by, remember he wanted Benjamin. Oh, he put them through a test. Only to reveal to them. Not to be ugly to them. But watch what happens. See, when you get tried... Joseph, I want to say this, Joseph never let a traumatic event change his identity. Joseph never let a traumatic event change his destiny. Psalm 66. Amen. Psalm 66, verse 10 through 12. Just stick with me. I love these verses because I, I know that in today's world, identity is under attack all the time, and we got to pass the test. Hallelujah. I know people are trying to say, you're this, and you're this, and you're a frog, and you're a dog, and who knows, whatever, you know. <laughs> you're an LGBTQIVU, and after a while, there's not enough letters to describe how stupid it gets. Hallelujah. Bless our Lord, O you people. Sound his praise aboard. Go with me to verse 10. Psalm 66, verse 10. Ready? To verse 10 now. Hallelujah. 66.10. Did you get it? For you have tried us. Who sees that? You have tried us, O oh God. You have refined us as silver is refined. Look at verse 11. Hallelujah. You brought us into the net. You let an oppressive burden upon our loins. Wow. Look at verse 12. Sometimes something's happening in life. I shall, look at verse 12. You made men ride over heads. We went through the fire and through the water. Yet, you brought us out in a place of abundance. <laughs> David knew what it's like to be tried. He's singing this psalm. He's worshiping the Lord with this. Say, man, I know what this is like. I know what it's like going through stuff. I know what it's like going through stuff, but I'm not going to quit. Hallelujah. He never quit. Look at Psalms. I mean, uh, sorry, 1 Samuel. Go with me to verse 18, yeah? I want to go all the way down to verse 28. I mentioned to you this, but I want to mention this again, 28 and 29. 1 Samuel 18, verse 28. Look what it says here. And I want you to see how David, when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. Look at verse 29. Hallelujah. Then Saul even was more afraid of David. Thus Saul was David's enemy continually. Talk about going through stuff. I mean, here now you've got an enemy against you, but this is where I want to explain to you something about the story. 
Jesus, you know, it's amazing. Like, it doesn't matter what was happening to Jesus. He trusted the Father. I mean, they were coming against him, spitting on him, ripping his beard. We've seen the passion of Christ, all the things that Jesus went through. Yet he went through the cross, through death, and came out. Hallelujah. And yet David has the enemy off him, off him, off him. But I thought I wrote down your fear-based. When you have a fear-based response, you always lose ground. When you have a faith-based response, you gain ground. Let me say it again. When you have a fear-based response, you lose ground. When you have a faith-based response, you gain ground. Peace is a response based in a secure identity that crushes the enemy. Peace that is a response based in a secure identity crushes the enemy. Peace is a response in a secure identity. See, when I know the God of peace rules and reigns in me, and I like, I now, you understand? get comfortable in the place that I know who I am in Christ Jesus, a peace comes over me. And that crushes the enemy. First Samuel 19, verses 9 and 10. Let me keep going. I'm trying to do this. First Samuel 19, 9 and 10. Look what it says. Now there was an evil spirit. Look at it. There was an evil spirit from the Lord on Saul. This is another thing. This blows people's mind theologically because they don't want to say an evil spirit from the Lord. And that's not the only place that's going to be mentioned. Remember when Saul rejected the word of the Lord, the Bible says an evil spirit was sent from the presence of the Lord to terrorize Saul. Trust me, God's in total control. Satan works with Satan. God works with God. Hallelujah. On Saul, as he was sitting in the house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing the harp with his hand. Yeah, David's worshiping ready again. Now you have to understand something. David... Because of his mouth, he lost one of, the, one of the daughters of Saul. It was supposed to be his reward from killing Goliath. But David's mouth got in the way. He didn't think it was worthy enough like we talked the other day. And so because David's mouth did not f- n- recognize who he was and that he was worthy enough, he lost who's with me, one of the daughters of Saul. Now he sends him out to kill Philistines by the thousands, puts him in the front of the battle, makes him command. And when he comes back, this terrorizing sp- Spirit is still on him, and David still goes back and sits down. You have to understand this. Just before this, David fought several battles for him before he sat down. He had to play the harp again. Now look at verse 20. Where we at? I mean, 1 Samuel 19, 9, verse 10. 1 Samuel 19, yeah, verse 10. Saul tried to pin David to the wall with his spear, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, so he struck the spear into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Okay. I wrote down here, mm, a leader must learn how to dodge spears. This might not mean much for you, but when you're in the business world, we've got some guys connect with me. They call me. They ask me for help. I'm in a very toxic environment. God, I can't stand working in this company. The boss is so wicked, so ugly, and he's always cussing. And, he come, and, they, and they're producing so much money for this guy. But this guy's mouth is out of control. And the enemy has sharp comments designed to pin you to the wall. It might even be your boss. Your boss might be your enemy. In this specific case, it was Saul against David. Of course, it's his boss. So if you're in the king and you're in the world, it could be, oh, my boss is trying to pin me to the wall. I know a son like that that's with us that's going through that very same thing a couple of weeks ago when I was talking to him. And the first thing I thought was, boy, it came to my head, leaders must learn how to dodge spears. And in Saul's jealous insecurity, you see, I, I think you have to keep it in perspective as well. The other thing you have to understand, it was Saul's jealous insecurity that's trying to pin David to the wall. The very person trying to throw the spear at you is the very person who doesn't know who they really are. They're struggling to find themselves. But David, you know, he just stayed in this place of trust and worship. One could almost say that trust is worship. The enemy sends the fiery darts of the wicked one against you. That's why we put on the breastplate of righteousness. 
Trust is worship. Trust travailed in faith. Amen. Will secure destiny. Trust traveled in faith. Maybe I should say this way. Trust that he's traveled in faith will secure destiny. Trust that he's traveled in faith. Sometimes we might not know all the circumstances. Some things might be mysterious around a relationship. But when we trust, when trust is traveled in faith, it will secure destiny. Jonathan was tested in a very powerful way. Who remembers Jonathan? Yet Jonathan and David are having a relationship. And you don't want to talk about a test now? Watch this test because I want to bring up something that I wrote down. It's called a blind spot. And just here in a second, I want Calvin to put up something. Uh, I, don't, I hope we can put this up, but I want you to see this. And this is in, uh, first I want you to go here with me um, to 1 Samuel 20, verses 16 and 17. He's still there. 1 Samuel 20. I didn't mean to go on like this. I'm trying to really get this. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 20. And I want you to see this in verse 16. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord require it in my hand. And look at verse 17. And Jonathan made David vow again because of his love for him, because he loved him as he loved his own life. So they had this powerful relationship, loyalty to David. Jonathan had loyalty to David, but I want you to see something. But he could not separate from Saul. Now watch what happens in 1 Samuel 20. This doesn't make any sense. This is when, this is even after this, Jonathan still didn't leave his father. Now, this is, this is sometimes happened with the soul ties. Some things happen like that. Soul, watch this. 1 Samuel 20, verse 30. I thought this was, I went down to 30 and I thought, what the heck's going on here? 1 Samuel 20, verse 30. Watch, look at this, yeah. Then Saul's anger burned against Jonathan. Yeah, now, okay, here's the father burning against his own son, Jonathan. He says to him, you son of a perverse, rebellious woman. Well, he just insulted his wife. Look how angry Saul is getting. He's now not just mad at his son, who's with me. He now tells him he's of a rebellious woman. He's mad at his wife. Do I not know that you are choosing the son of Jesse to your own shame and the shame of your mother's nakedness? Look how he's so angry. I mean, he's like getting insulting. Verse 31, ready? Watch this, just watch this, verse 31, keep going now. 1 Samuel 20, 31. For as long as the son of Jesse lives on earth, neither you nor your, your kingdom, now, now Saul's saying Jonathan's kingdom, your kingdom, he knows that, will be established. So you he's trying to provoke his son now as well. He hates his son, angered his son now, insulting the mother. Neither your kingdom will be Therefore now send and bring him to me, for he must surely die. Verse 32. But Jonathan answered Saul, his father, and said, Why should we, he be put to death? What has he done? Verse 33. I want you to see this is a powerful thing. Then Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him down. Here, Saul is trying to kill his own son. I don't know if some of you saw that in Scripture. Here, a father is now throwing his spear. Who's, you talk about a spirit on him. An anger on him. Now he wants to kill his own son. Strike him down so that Jonathan knew that his father had decided to put David to death. Can you see that? I mean, this is crazy how the enemy works. Fear, anger, murder of a son. Give me this thing I gave you on a blind spot. Let me give you this. I don't know if we got it, but um, I had this in my notes the other day. It's called, What is a Blind Spot? What is a Blind Spot? I can send this to you because... Oh, that's small, but anyhow. What is a blind spot? Who's with me? Now I want you to see this. Watch this. What is a blind spot? I just want you to see something here. Something happens when you don't know who you are. You know, when we're driving down a road, to pass the test when you're driving, when you go to driver school, they'll tell you something about a blind spot. You can look in your mirrors, look at this mirror, look at this mirror, but they'll tell you sometimes when you're driving, turn your head. Who's with me? And the driver who's driving with you will see whether you're turning your head or not and checking because they want to know if you are checking the blind spot. Somebody help me. And sometimes we fail a test because we don't recognize the blind spot. Uh, maybe they can make that bigger, but let me just read it to you, the blind spot. <laughs> Number one, anatomy. The point of entry of an optic nerve on the retina 
intensified to light. Amen? On a retina intensified to light. I'm sure they're working on it. Number two, an area where a person's view is obstructed. The angle rear view mirror eliminates blind spots on both sides of the car. Okay? Uh, uh, Webster's includes an area in which one fails to exercise judgment or discrimination. I'll send this to you. So I want you just to listen very carefully. I know this is, well, I'm not trying to lay, but has the blind spots got so big we can't see Satan coming as an angel of light? Satan would like to keep you in the book of Ecclesiastes, which shows what man is like without the Holy Spirit. Spirit interprets spirits, dove eyes. What is a blind spot? I felt like throwing up today, seeing so many ministers lacking spiritual discernment, drowning in doctrinal mixture. I wrote this years ago. Polluting what Jesus, what would Jesus do? People creating a Jesus to fit their own ideas and the Jesus that they would like to see today. Then we have a church discussing regulations, ignoring heavenly regulations. Blinded by political bias and media. Number one, okay, I go down and say, number one, exchanging spiritual, amen, revealed knowledge for sensual knowledge, amen. Vision becomes distorted when natural knowledge takes precedence. Vision becomes distorted when natural knowledge takes precedence. Christianity without the supernatural moves towards religious bondage. Christianity without the supernatural moves towards religious bondage. Preaching the gospel of conform conformism rather than transformation makes the gospel powerful. Moses put a veil over his face because of the glory of God shining so bright. Why are men of God putting on a mask? It appears to be a mockery to what would Jesus do. It appears to be a blind spot in the anointed mantle or clear. I just found this in my notes one day. There's a lot of other things I have on blind spots, another whole thing, but it's like four or five pages I wrote. But this was done long ago. And I'm just trying to say to you, sometimes what happens is we fail the test because we cannot recognize a blind spot. Something in our own emotions that God's been trying to tell us for a long time. I want you to change this. I want you to change this. It's not a problem. Don't tell me I'm wrong in this area. It's like they want it to remain a blind spot. Don't push that button. Who's with me? There's nothing there. <laughs> it's a blind spot. There's nothing there. Don't go there in my emotions. Who's with me? Don't talk about that. Or like some people it could be, uh, there's many issues. Hallelujah, a lot of issues. Some people could be just weight. Don't talk to me about my weight. Who's with me? <laughs> it could be a lot of issues. Not, be, not being critical, but we could pick anything. Hallelujah. Don't talk to me about... Amen. And so we go through a lot of these things, and Jonathan had a blind spot. His blind spot was, he knows David is going to be king. Who's with me? His dad has even thrown a spear at him. His dad has cursed his mother, insulted her. I mean, tried to murder his own son. But the wrong soul ties created a blind spot. How do you handle disagreement? David comes along in 1 Samuel 23. Let me just narrow this up for you and give you a picture. You know what's going to happen to Jonathan? He's not going to leave his father. Even though David becomes king of Judah and David's now be about to become king of Israel, Jonathan still remains with his father, who's with me, and ends up dying, who's with me, in the battle with, in, in that, with his father. He didn't have to go that route. But for some reason, family, this family bond... I, oh, that's strange. But in this specific case, this family bond with the wicked dad could not be separated. And it became a blind spot. Sometimes we don't know how to separate from something from the past. We don't know how to forgive and forget. Amen. Then after that, David gets a word from the Lord. And the Lord tells him, hey, I want you to do something. You know, David's so crazy. In 1 Samuel 23... They, they said to David, saying, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Kiliath and purging the threshing floors there. In 1 Samuel 23, Kiliath 
was a town who's with me in Judea. At this time, David's not king. At this time, who's with me? Oh, you watch this. He's running away from Saul. But the prophet comes along and somehow he gets arrested by the voice of God saying, take your men, go fight this battle. Help Saul, who's with me, the guy trying to kill you, defeat this enemy coming against a town in Judea, who's with me. So David's like, wait a second, I'm running from this wicked, this guy trying to kill me. And now the Lord says, no, 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 no. The guy trying to kill you is having a problem. One of his cities are getting ready to be destroyed by an enemy. But I want you to turn around, David. Go, save all these people in the city and destroy the Philistines. Fight them on behalf of your wicked king Saul, who's with me, and defeat them all, even though while Saul's still chasing you. Come on. Oh, you don't, you don't, you've got to get this picture. <laughs> but he got the word from the Lord. And I wrote down here, he said, defend the city of Kiliath, Judah, for the Philistines. And Judah was the one later on who ended up first making him king. But I like this. I wrote down, can we fight for people who refuse to protect us? Can we fight for people who refuse to protect us? Saul's not going to protect you right now. Saul's not going to help you. He wants to kill you, so he don't even care if you go fight those Philistines to stop them from taking that whole city from children of God, Judah. But God gets the word from the prophet. David obeys. And I believe this was a seed that ended up causing Judah to make him king. And when you're walking through a lot of stuff, you've got to keep your eyes on God. I wrote down here, the power of God moves with the mind of God to fulfill the will of God. The power of God moves with the mind of God to fulfill the will of God. Having God's thoughts attracts the power of God. Having God's thoughts attracts the power of God. Having God's thoughts attract the power of God. So when we get our thoughts lined up with God, and we get the thoughts of God, and we say, okay, God says, what does God say about me? You're a son of God. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. When I understand who I am in Christ, and David, his old kingship was to do with this. Remember, that's where we started. David perceived. Amen. Isn't that where we started? David perceived that God had made him what? King. Isn't that what we said? David perceived that God had made him king. Isn't that amazing. It took him a while to realize the Lord did this. Amen. What does God have for you? What's the plans that God has for you? We're not to, you know, today we can't, you can't do anything really normal today. I believe that if there's ever society that's trying to tear identity apart, and identity is under a big test today, the kids are being invaded. I was sharing with my own kids and my other wife yesterday. It's like you can't, uh, it's so sad that you can't turn on one DC thing these days without seeing a lesbian relationship or a homosexual relationship or this relationship or something. It's like the enemy's on a full onslaught to tear identity down to rip identity apart, to invade the children's world, to just t make them something that is not what God designed them, to be a male and a female, made in God's image and likeness. Amen? To change the vocabulary. Cha we were talking about that yesterday. If there's ever a time that identity is under a test, come on. We are in that place. And you have got to find the place where you know who you are, who's you are, where you're going, what God's called you to do. You've got to solve that in your spirit. It gives you strength, amen, to do what God's called you to do. I just want to encourage you on that. And, you know, when, when we get there, when I, it's like I'm talking to someone the other day about healing. I said, I don't have to think about healing, wonder about healing. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. So I know before God ever made the earth. By stripes, I'm already healed. So healing's not an option. I know healing's mine. I know Jesus, the healer, lives in me. I'm not wondering about healing, thinking about healing. I am continually living in the healing power of God. The blood of Jesus flows through me. I was healed. I am healed. I are healed. I was healed. By stripes, you were healed. By stripes, First Peter 2.25, you are healed. You know, Peter's mother-in-law, he healed her and said, 
He, Jesus was quoting Isaiah 53 when he healed Peter's mother-in-law, basically before he went to the cross, saying, hey, to Peter's mother-in-law, by stripes you're healed, but I haven't gone to the cross yet. It was like giving her a credit card miracle. You know what I mean? Paying her healing before he ever died on the cross. What he was trying to say is, I already know this because I know that I'm the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, knowing, knowing he's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. He knew he had to go through that death for, for a moment, who's with me, he became little lower than the angels, only just for a moment, who's with me. For a short time, he became little lower than the angels. But now he is above the angels, who's with me, he's conquered death, hell and the grave, who's with me. And we've been made in his image and likeness. In that alone, right now, if you receive the word of the Lord that we're speaking, even some watching, if you receive what we're saying, that by his stripes you were healed, you are healed, you is healed, you were healed before time again. If you, if you build this into your identity, hallelujah, healing will automatically manifest. You're not trying to look for healing, it's yours. I don't think God wants anything less for us. There's so much, and we've got to take a hold, and we've got to know, and we've got to let it become a, take a hold of your spirit. You, I can read certain verses, but man, if there's a way that we could stuff it down inside your spirit and you could really see that seed planted and grow and let it become a part of who you are. We know this has got to do with personal relationship. We know when we spend more time with someone, we become like them. Look what happens when people get married. They start looking like each other. There's so many some things. It's strange things start happening when you get married. Hallelujah. You know, you, you could tell a couple, they will walk down and say, yeah, we know you're married. <laughs> Doesn't take much, hallelujah. There's just something about being married. There's certain things that begin to happen. Identities begin to connect. Who's with me? There's something powerful. Hallelujah. Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you this morning. We thank you for every mother. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. Lord, I thank you. Right now, Lord, I thank you. Even, even in the midst of that, Lord, I thank you, Father. Establish your word. Let's be like Mary, Lord. Be it unto us according to your word. You sent your word to heal us. We receive it. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. And I know, Lord, you said in Acts 17, 28, in him, in him we live, move, and have our being. Lord, let us find ourselves there. Let us find ourselves there, Lord. In him we live, move, and have our being. In him we live, move, and have our being. Let's identify in that. In him we live, move, and have our being. Lord, establish that right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you sent your word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for every person in this place right now, Lord. Thank you that your word is getting settled in them. Without you, O oh Lord, we can do nothing. And right now we trust you, Lord. Trust is worship. Maybe think about it that way. Trust is worship. It's, a form, it's like worship. I trust you. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. I acknowledge you in all my ways. I acknowledge you in all my ways. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are guiding me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are leading me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are directing me. Thank you, Father, that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path right now. Right now. We need you, Holy Spirit. We need to know your voice. We need to hear your word. Help us to change, Lord. Help us to make those adjustments. Uh, find, give us the right word, Lord. Thank you for your, for you, Holy Spirit. You are the comforter. You're the counselor. You're the helper. You're the advocate. I ask you to do exactly that right now. I can't, you can counsel people a thousand times better than I could even try. You are the ultimate counselor. You're the ultimate comforter. You're the ultimate guider. You're the ultimate leader, director, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, Zubri e Katarada Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Right now, we yield to you. We yield to your presence. Just yield to him. We yield to your anointing. We yield to your direction. 
Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We're not going to lean on our own understanding. We're going to acknowledge you, Lord, in all our ways. Thank you, Lord, for the mind of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for anointed thoughts. Thank you, Lord, for directing our minds, directing our thoughts. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to make the right decisions. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. Help us to speak words refined by fire, pure words that have been tested, washed, washed in the water of the word. Holy Spirit, you're our helper. Right now, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Right now, you're the comforter. Just let him comfort you right now. Let the Holy Spirit come for you right now. Let's let him move right now. Let him move right now. Don't care about anybody around you. Just let him move right now. I surrender to you. I surrender to you. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs>